All right, we'll now get started on today's energy symposium today. We have uh, Emre Jentzer, and before I introduce him more formally, I will go through uh, the talk for next week. So I'm Kerry Keene, um, Assistant Director of the Energy Institute and Research Scientist here at the University of Texas. Uh, the Energy Institute sponsors this energy symposium series, weekly series. Uh, before I introduce today's guest, uh, next week we're going to have um, the Distinguished Lecture Series of the K. Bailey Hutchison Center for Energy Law and Business. And this is going to be a panel discussion amongst three individuals, Sean Cumberland, who is Managing Partner of uh, NCAP Investments, Denise Dinduruk, uh, who is at Shell, um, looking at carbon capture, and Will Glasimir, who is at McKinsey and Company. So join us next week for that discussion. But today it's my pleasure to announce uh, that we will have being uh, the speaker, Emre Gentscher. Uh, he is a research scientist at the MIT Energy Initiative. He's gonna talk to us about his modeling, uh, detailed modeling uh, that he calls Sesame on uh, energy system transition and energy system modeling. So the theme of his research is to identify you know, the optimal utilization of resources for the evolving energy system facing the dual challenge of increasing demand for energy while reducing their environmental footprint. So this is of concern to many of us and very much of interest. Um, with that said, I will now uh, pass over to Emre and stop sharing my screen. Uh, for any of you that have questions as normal, uh, please submit your questions in the Q&A or question and answer feature of the webinar. And if you have a question of clarification, you can go ahead and submit that immediately or submit questions at any time and I will intervene and uh, get clarification on the question as it comes up as needed. So with that said, uh, I will now stop speaking and Emre, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kerry, for the introduction and for inviting me to speak in the Energy Symposium series. Uh, so uh, today I'll be talking about a new framework that we've been developing and at its application about the energy transition uh, and how this can be used for making better decisions uh, from different perspectives. And I'll start with an overview of the motivation and then give you examples from uh, different sectors and the sector coupling issues that uh, are very relevant for today's energy system. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions and I'm happy to interrupt during the talk and try to clarify or answer your questions. So basically, uh, when we look at today's energy system, what we see is there is a huge change in how energy sectors has been treated and has come together. So what we observe is that traditionally power sector, industrial sector, transportation and building sectors uh, have been uh, quite siloed. So uh, th there are like applications on power systems, similarly for transportation and so on and so forth. But with this energy transition, what we observe is that these sectors are coming together. So there is a big convergence of energy subsectors. And some uh, links from these examples is the electrification of transportation. So with EVs, we cannot only look at the transportation sector now, we need to understand the implications to power sector. Similarly for industry, we are talking about uh, decarbonization. And uh, when we speak about decarbonization, there are many uh, important connections. Uh, so one is of course the electrification of many industrial processes through electrochemistry or other methods, which is a connection between power and industrial sectors. And secondly, hydrogen, is supposed to play a huge role in decarbonization, which connects back to industry. And we, we can include more and more examples uh, to highlight this uh, new paradigm. Uh, but one of the challenges that we see is also understanding like methodologically from an analysis point of view, how we will understand this new system. And when you look at the traditional tools and techniques, and I am a chemical engineer by training and a more focusing on the process systems engineering side. And when we look at the traditional way of modeling, all of these sectors are uh, like, they have their own tools, they have their own models. 
And this is how we started this SME project because we wanted to have a single platform that will have everything inside. Also, you will be able to highlight the connections, links between subsectors. And the second important piece about this uh, approach is uh, here I'm giving an example from uh, transportation sector. On the left hand side, you see various resources, uh, crude oil, biomass, coal, wind, solar, natural gas. And on the right hand side, we have different transportation modes. So either passenger vehicles or heavy duty transportation. And when our goal is to decarbonize, we really need to understand all the emission sources. And here, this schematic highlights all the emissions for various pathways that you see here. Uh, all the emissions are uh, highlighted in uh, gray arrows. And so the main comparison I want to make here is that one potential decarbonization method is electrification of transportation. And as you can see, there is no tailpipe emissions for EVs. Uh, but actually, when you look at the entire value chain, depending on how we produce electricity, it can be quite emission intensive it, if it's coming from coal, or it can be very low carbon if it's coming from solar and wind, or we use carbon capture. And similarly, we can increase all of these scenarios. And uh, as you can see, there are even for a very simple passenger vehicle case, there are many cases that needs to be explored like resource availability, using different resources with different processes, adding carbon capture on or off, or various transport methods for the uh, resources, so on and so forth. So basically there is a huge search space for making all of these decisions that needs to be treated. Secondly, from a decarbonization point of view, we really need to take a life cycle assessment approach. So looking at single sources and single uh, time uh, of emission is not enough. So we really need to understand the entire value chain. And so these two motivations in mind, we have developed SESAMI tools and SESAMI is short for Sustainable Energy System Analysis uh, Modeling Environment. Uh, and with this platform, uh, we wanted to develop a, a framework that will enable us to assess and compare various technology options uh, to meet different energy demands, perform technology and system scenario analysis. And scenario analysis is really key here because we want to play around and understand the trade-offs between various options. Also explore the implications of market and policy dynamics. And, uh, and one of the key areas is perform cross-sector comparison. So we high we represent all the sectors uh, and basically using this platform you can understand this different sector comparisons and sector couplings and on the left hand side you see the user interface so uh, we are planning to launch uh, the open access version uh, quite soon so that uh, we, you, people will be able to use it uh, by uh, going into our website sesame.mit.edu uh, and perform some of the analysis that I will show you today. And I also want to spend a couple of minutes on what's the underlying engine and how we uh, develop this modeling environment. So it is a very modular uh, framework. And here you see uh, under the hood, we have this modular structure that you see in this slide. Uh, we represent the entire energy system in terms of six life cycle stages. Uh, upstream, midstream, process, carbon capture, utilization, and storage, gate to user and end use. And uh, upstream represent various resources. And you can see here, we represent both fossil and renewable resources. And we have very uh, high level details on uh, each one of these. You can include your own modules, you can modify existing modules, so on and so forth. It, it's quite flexible. Uh, and also we, uh, we represent the transportation of uh, these resources by midstream in terms of the state of the uh, energy. So it's gas, liquid, or solid. And processing is looking at the conversion of resources into valuable products or electricity. Uh, carbon capture is an important uh, vector for the decarbonization. So we have an entire uh, section on that looking at different separation methods, uh, compression of CO2, utilization opportunities, and storage. 
Uh, and finally, in the end use, we look at major end users, electricity, fuel for transportation, chemicals, so on and so forth. Uh, so with this platform, you can build pathways that represent an end-to-end -end energy conversion uh, value chain or systems uh, which are combination of various pathways. And these systems can be as small as uh, two or three pathways or as large as pathways that will represent an entire region and entire city, so on and so forth. So with this kind of analysis environment, what kind of questions we are answering is the uh, next slide. Basically here, you can see some of the topics that we are currently working on. Uh, one of the major questions that we have is, of course, is there a role for natural gas in energy transition, either as a bridge fuel or uh, in conjunction with carbon capture, can we continue using natural gas? Uh, what's the best strategy to decarbonize industry? And I think it's especially relevant for uh, Texas because of uh, like large footprint of uh, industrial facilities and what, what's the best way of uh, decarbonizing, whether it's with carbon capture, uh, using uh, hydrogen, uh, electrification of industry, so on and so forth. So there are many options, but uh, how we pick one or will we use a combination of all of the above, so on and so forth. And similarly, regional differences play a huge role, uh, whether you are in uh, US, in a state in the US versus in a developing country will make a huge difference in the ultimate and optimal uh, method for the energy transition. Uh, so we need to also account for these differences. Uh, how can we do that? And when we account for these differences, how the results will change, so on and so forth. Similarly, electrification for transportation, for other methods, so on and so forth. So basically, these are some of the ongoing projects in our uh, research group. And uh, I will give you a couple of examples, but also happy to discuss in Q&A uh, more details of, about some other topics. So during this talk, I will start with the power sector uh, and give you an example of how the system restructuring affects the power sector. And then I will give you an example from transportation. And the, in the final part of the presentation, I will just combine these two and show you some of the dynamics between power system and transportation sector. On the power system, uh, I will take an example from California. Uh, and uh, you, you, you can see the, these papers are uh, available, so I have put the references, so please feel free to uh, see the full uh, article if you're interested. And here, basically, the example that we have is for California, over the last decade or so, we've seen a huge change in the power system. Uh, so it was uh, more dominantly uh, provided by natural gas uh, for power generation, and it's becoming more and more renewable heavy. And in this, uh, so we have split this into two. Uh, the red curve is natural gas uh, power plants, and blue curves are uh, wind, hydro, and solar uh, combined. And this shows you how the, uh, like, the, there's a huge shift starting in 2016, and now uh, like renewables and natural gas kind of contribute equally to the uh, existing uh, power generation. And with this, I would like to show you how the composition of natural gas power plant generation has changed over time. And uh, you can see in this uh, slide, so in the top row, we have combined cycle units uh, from 2011 to 2017, and we see the same trends uh, moving forward. Uh, and in the bottom row, we have the gas turbine units. So, all, and these different colors represent different loading ratios. So, uh, and in the next slide, I will show you different loadings, but basically there are full loading, which is nameplate capacity of both combined cycle units and gas turbine units. Uh, near full load, it is 80% and above capacity factor relative to nameplate capacity. Uh, part load, uh, above 40%, up to 80%. And uh, startup and shutdown is when you have uh, startup or shutdown events for these units. And with these, uh, 
over time, what you will observe is that for combined cycle units, starting in 2000, uh, like 15 to 16, there is a, a observed decrease in emission uh, in generation. So, and this is mostly due to having high solar in the system, so that we don't need base load power from natural gas combined cycle units as much as we used to in the previous years. And for gas turbine units, uh, in the same period of time, we see a, a change in operation an increase in total generation from these units uh, and it continued to increase uh, and the cap average capacity factor for gas turbine units has increased from approximately five to six percent to ten percent today uh, so and also if you are not familiar combined cycle power plants are more efficient because you combine a gas turbine unit with a, a bottoming cycle steam turbine unit and you can reach approximately 55% uh, efficiency from natural gas to power. And gas turbine units are quick responding, so they can come online very quickly in five to 10 minutes, uh, but their generation uh, efficiency is lower uh, and they are mostly used for peaking capacity. So just to balance the system or if you need uh, electricity uh, with uh, peak load, so on and so forth. And you can also see this kind of trend here. So uh, it comes online and stays online for a while. And uh, X axis here is the hour of the day. And then uh, it's shut down. Uh, so when we look at these operations, there is also an emission consequences. So here uh, we used real uh, power plant data uh, to highlight how the efficiency and CO2 emission intensity is changing for these units under various uh, loading conditions. And here uh, with four colors, we represent with uh, violet uh, full load, blue near full load, green part load and red startup and shutdown. And as you can see in both cases, and these are two randomly picked combined cycle units, uh, which has similar uh, capacity factors, kind of representing the average fleet uh, for California. And you can see the efficiency uh, reaches approximately 55% when it's operated at full load. And when you go to near full load, it goes down a little bit to range of 45 to 50%. And as you move down to part load operation, uh, it further goes down and then startup and shutdown are quite inefficient because you basically need to heat up the unit uh, without necessarily generating too much electricity. And uh, you can also observe this from an emissions perspective and efficiency and emissions are kind of uh, correlated, like uh, proportional uh, because uh, you emit more per electricity generated if you don't have high efficiencies. And as you can see here for startup and shutdown events, the emission intensity is quite high. And as you go to uh, steady state operation at full load and nearly full load, your uh, operation, your uh, emission intensity goes down. So basically you want to spend as much as time in the uh, high loading times, as you can see here. So for combined cycle units, let's say 70% plus and minimize the startup and shutdown events. And unfortunately, what we observe is that with changing energy system, we need to increase the number of startup and shutdowns and operate it in a cycling zone, uh, which increases the emission intensity of these units. However, we can of course reduce these. One is we can uh, introduce more flexible uh, units. Secondly, we can uh, use hybrid plants, which has some energy storage options. And in California, they have implemented some of these units. And other operational uh, possibilities is discuss this using carbon capture. Uh, so when we talk about decarbonizing any CO2 emitting uh, facility like uh, industrial facility or power plant, carbon capture is one of the solutions that comes to mind. And here I want to highlight one challenge for this. Uh, so it is uh, 
obvious that we will need to uh, significantly reduce the CO2 emissions of these units. But of course, from an operational point of view, we see a very dynamic operation for these units. So uh, the, the reason we see these kind of change in the system is because uh, when you look at the hourly generation, uh, we see a cycling for a combined, and this is this should be the same uh, unit that you've seen in the graph. So this is the same two, 260 unit. Uh, so here, basically, the outlet of this unit is changing from 40% to 100% all the time. And we see multiple startup and shutdown events, as you can see from the uh, load going to zero. Furthermore, we have many uh, periods of time that these generators do not generate any electricity. So they are completely uh, shut down. So the implication of this in terms of carbon capture is, first of all, carbon capture plants are similar to chemical facilities. So they, want, they like to be operated steady state in a continuous manner. And when you have these kind of dynamic operation, it's really hard to operate these, uh, especially the amine uh, facilities that is the most developed technology today. And secondly, from a cost perspective, the utilization of these units will be quite low. So for this particular unit, the annual capacity factor is 32%. And when you deploy a carbon capture uh, facility, you will have a similar uh, capacity factor, which will be increasing the uh, like cost of capture uh, because you have so much capital expenditure up front and then you are not using these to capture uh, as much CO2 as you'd like. One option to replace all of this is of course decoupling carbon capture and power generation and potentially using hydrogen in these units. Uh, there are challenges to that uh, because, uh, first of all, the hydrogen is quite costly today. And secondly, uh, retrofitting these plants are not as easy as it sounds. Uh, however, we've also looked at these cases uh, for gas turbine units. And gas turbine capacity factors are even lower than this. And I would like to share with you some of the results that we've seen and whether this can be an economical solution uh, to use hydrogen to produce electricity in a low carbon manner. Uh, and since we are looking at the gas turbine units, I just want to share with you the capacity factor distribution of uh, gas turbine units in California uh, in 2019. And as you can see, most of these units uh, are lower than 15% capacity factor. And this dashed line represents 15%. Uh, there are some gas turbine units that generate electricity at higher capacity factors. And these are mostly units in uh, industrial facilities, uh, either uh, part of cogen plants or uh, they, they have their own uh, off-grid generators. And But most of the time, we will be in this zone, which has uh, 5 to 15% capacity factors. And the question we try to answer with this uh, study is, what's the best decarbonization option from a cost perspective uh, of replacing these natural gas fired gas turbines. And the options we have is using uh, lithium ion batteries, uh, using hydrogen fuel gas turbines with uh, hydrogen from steam methane reforming with carbon capture and using the same units with electrolytic uh, hydrogen uh, from solar plants. And here, uh, for all the gas turbine units that uh, we have in California, uh, the, the results are quite interesting because uh, we don't have a single solution. So the model does not pick use always lithium ion battery or use always hydrogen fuel gas turbine units. And uh, we need a mix of both. Uh, and as you can see in this uh, map, uh, so the blue, uh, the green uh, circles represents the hydrogen fuel gas turbine units and size represents the size of the plant. Uh, uh, and basically the uh, 
reds are the lithium ion batteries and the uh, yellow dots are the electrolyzer hubs, uh, the optimal location for electrolyzer hubs. And as you can see, so there is a nice mix of both. So we need both lithium ion batteries and hydrogen fuel gas turbine units for the minimal cost uh, operation. Uh, however, when we look at the levelized cost of electricity, as you can see, these are very high. So uh, keeping in mind that the capacity factor of these units are very low, so the like capital expenditure uh, will be quite high relative to the generated electricity. But still, the today's electricity price is shown in the basically uh, with these plants with these uh, dashed lines. So the blue uh, bar is showing the range for uh, hydrogen fuel gas turbine units with electrolytic hydrogen, and red is lithium ion batteries, and the blue is uh, using blue hydrogen, which is natural gas reforming with carbon capture instead of uh, electrolytic hydrogen. Uh, and as you can see, so the, today blue hydrogen is more economical, and it's the most economical option between these three. Uh, and you can get very high uh, emission reductions with that because if you use autothermal reforming, you can significantly increase the carbon capture rate uh, to up to 95, 96%. And you will see a, a minimal cost relative to other options. But of course, it will not be zero carbon. So with these two, you can really achieve zero carbon systems uh, if you're providing your electricity from solar and wind. Uh, and what this tells us is like we have an immediate solution uh, that can kind of help getting the balancing power uh, from gas turbine units to a cleaner option. Uh, in the meantime, this doesn't solve the problem because uh, with this study, we are only looking at how we can replace an existing gas turbine units. But as we move to a more renewable heavy system, the need for a, a peaking plant will change. So it will not stay the same as we have today. Uh, so it's not an ultimate, ultimate solution that shows how it can work, but it at least shows that hydrogen can have a role even under these very pessimistic conditions uh, economically. And now I will switch gears to a transportation example, uh, and I will talk about uh, a results of a study that we have done uh, on the mobility of the future for passenger vehicles. And I will come back to the life cycle emissions perspective. And here uh, on the left-hand side of this graph, we show the greenhouse gas emissions per distance, and we compare various powertrain options uh, and fuel production options. Here, we the blue curves represent uh, various colors of uh, hydrogen with hydrogen fuels an electric vehicle. A solid line is electrolytic hydrogen with grid electricity, dashed steam methane reforming, dotted steam methane reforming with carbon capture, and the final blue line is the uh, electrolysis with wind. And the other three colors are internal combustion engine vehicles, black, uh, hybrid electric vehicles, red, and battery electric vehicles, green. And the first finding in, of this graph is basically, depending on how you produce your fuel, hydrogen can be anywhere. So it can be the most emitting version option if you use grid electricity with electrolysis today, or the least emitting option if you use wind electricity with electrolysis. Uh, secondly, across all these options, we see a emission intensity decrease over time. So this is mostly due to vehicle manufacturing emissions going down uh, with having more renewables and more uh, low carbon uh, manufacturing systems available. And also fuel economy improvements over time. So this will be with light weighting of the vehicles, engine improvements, so on and so forth. Uh, and in terms of today's technologies, basically if we switch from internal combustion engine vehicles to fuel cell electric vehicles, uh, or hybrid electric vehicles. If fuel cell electric vehicles use hydrogen that is mostly produced in the US with steam methane reforming, you see a decline of 40% in terms of emissions, which is quite substantial emission reduction. And if we use average grid 
uh, average US grid, better electric vehicle can get you a emission reduction of 55 to 60%. And depending on the state that we are in or the NERC region we are in, this emission reduction can be much more significant, or it can be, of course, less significant if we still have uh, coal in the mix. And final point in this graph is basically, even when we use wind uh, derived hydrogen with fuels electric vehicles, you don't go to zero emission uh, system. And this is important because unless you completely decarbonize manufacturing industry, and this includes manufacturing of vehicles as well as manufacturing of wind turbines or solar panels, there is always a carbon tag in these uh, systems. And so it's important to keep in mind that really going to zero emission is hard and requires having some negative emission technologies in the mix. Uh, even even if we do everything in our power, uh, like use renewables with electrolysis, so on and so forth. And now I want to switch from like a more individual uh, vehicles to a systems perspective. And here I would like to give you an overview of different futures uh, about electric vehicle penetration in the US. And I will use two projections from uh, published reports from uh, Energy Information Agency's Annual Energy Outlook 2020 and Bloomberg Energy's uh, uh, Outlook report uh, from 2019. And these two projections are quite different as you can see. Uh, so we use baseline case for AEO report, uh, which still has higher internal combustion engine vehicle sales uh, throughout 2050. And I'm sure it will change, but this is the baseline that they have reported. And for Bloomberg en uh, Energy, what we see is uh, it has much aggressive uh, electricity, BEV penetration, and BEV is shown in green in both graphs. Uh, so by 2050, almost 50% of the sales are expected to be EVs. So with this, the main point is there's large uncertainty. So which one will happen is uncertain. It can be, uh, it's, in my open, opinion, it will be more likely that the uh, Bloomberg energy is more realistic, but it can be somewhere in between or it can be more aggressive. Uh, it's up to us. So with carbon taxes, investment decisions, and also consumer choices, we will see which one will be dominating. Uh, and finally, it's, we shouldn't assume that BNEF is unrealistic because uh, so far they have uh, underprojected EV sales, and uh, this can even be an underprojection moving forward. But the point here is that there are many options, and we need to perform some scenario analysis to understand the decarbonization cost and uh, the, the composition of the fleet. And with that, I would like to give you an example of how we use uh, our scenario analysis tool and also uh, what kind of insights we can gain from this. So uh, as we looked at, so the sales is uh, approximately 50% by 2050, and it's kind of linearly increasing from today. And the second graph that we have looked at the fleet, total fleet, and as you can see, the fleet is increasing uh, over time. So we expect to see more vehicles on the road. Uh, and the share of uh, EVs, even though the sales are 50%, it's still not close to 50% because each vehicle is driven by uh, approximately for uh, 20 years, 18 to 20 years. And we see a decline in fuel use. Uh, one reason is, of course, we will be seeing more electric vehicle on the road that will uh, drive down the uh, gasoline consumption but secondly as we've discussed uh, we will expect we, we expect to see a fuel economy improvement of these vehicles so for per mile driven you will use less energy and finally uh, greenhouse gas emissions which is the main topic of interest is we see a significant decline relative to today's value 
uh, it's not going to zero. It is still significant, uh, but we, we will see a huge decline over time. And let's compare this with the uh, AEO's baseline uh, analysis. So here we looked at approximately 800 million tons in 2050. And if we look at the case from AEO, we still have 1,100 million tons uh, CO2 emitted. So first of all, I think for these two scenarios, the, uh, I was expecting it to see a little bit uh, more decrease for the EV case, but still there is a substantial decrease relative to the uh, like internal combustion engine vehicle case. So now let's look at the power system side. So we have this uh, huge EV growth. And what does this mean in terms of the lithium ion battery in sales? And so for this option, uh, we looked at the lithium ion battery in the vehicles. And over time, in 2050, we expect to see approximately 900 gigawatt hour equivalent lithium ion batteries. Uh, in the vehicles in uh, that year. Uh, just to give you context, uh, today's world lithium ion production is approximately 200 gigawatt hour. And uh, McKinsey projected to see approximately 2600 gigawatt hour in 2030. So given the size of the uh, total fleet, global fleet, uh, basically this projection is kind of equivalent of only uh, electrifying uh, passenger vehicles. Uh, and when we think about uh, using these for utility scale, uh, energy storage, so on and so forth, so we will still need to significantly increase the production of uh, batteries globally. Uh, and second, uh, of course, the observation is total lithium ion battery in the fleet. And we see there's a huge, uh, approximately 12,000 or 12 terawatt hour equivalent lithium ion battery in the fleet. Uh, so this size of battery, of course, uh, reminds us opportunities. Uh, one can be vehicle to grid opportunities. Can we use some of these vehicles for balancing the power grid for energy storage options? And if we uh, slow charge these at six hours, basically there is a two terawatt capacity, which is twice as much uh, US, uh, grid, uh, US power grid today. Uh, and by 2050, uh, we will have approximately seven terawatt hour uh, of EV charging demand, EV charging demand for this particular scenario. And this is equivalent of 20% of today's generation capacity. And also I would like to remind you that we hope to provide this electricity from renewable sources, from solar and wind. And when we have solar and wind, of course, there's intermittency. So uh, we need to overbuild uh, these uh, just to make sure that we have enough energy when we need it. So basically for having 700 terawatt hour electricity, uh, we probably need to have significantly higher uh, generation capacity, uh, maybe three times or four times more than the peak capacity. And finally, about the lithium ion batteries retiring. So you see over time when we don't, uh, when the lifetime of these vehicle ends, we will still have useful life for these batteries. And th these can be used for second life applications or power system applications or for recycling. And uh, also there is a huge opportunity and challenge here because we will see a massive amounts of uh, retiring batteries from uh, EV fleet. Uh, looking from this, is this growth feasible? Are there any resource constraints? So we discussed about lithium ion batteries in uh, the fleet and in the sales. And let's now look at what does it mean in terms of the resources? So today, uh, we use approximately three kilotons of lithium uh, in the US. And you can see here is that the lithium ion battery, lithium in sales will increase to 140 kilotons uh, by 2050 for this 
scenarios. Uh, today's world consumption is approximately 60 kilotons. And uh, when you look at the reserves, there are reserves available. The only challenge will be really scaling up the production. So uh, relative to today's uh, production, we just need twice as much just to meet US uh, passenger vehicle fleet. And of course, uh, with the global fleet, this will be significantly higher. Uh, but from resource perspective, it's, it looks it's feasible. It's just about the question of how fast we can scale up the production. And similarly, cobalt is very important for these uh, batteries. And uh, we see a very similar scenario. So basically, today's US consumption is 12 kiloton. Uh, and we expect to see on the uh, order of 60 kilotons by 2050. Uh, and relative to world consumption, it is uh, almost half of today's world consumption, uh, but it can be significantly uh, scaled up as there are resources and reserves available. And one uh, technological aspect about this is, of course, these graphs assume today's battery technologies. And we hope to see an improvement in battery technologies as well that will change the chemistries and the relative ratio of cobalt and lithium. And one scenario is if we switch battery technologies to a low cobalt chemistry, actually you can see it can be significantly reduced cobalt consumption. And then it can be on the same order of magnitude that today's uh, cobalt consumption in the US. So these are, of course, like basically there are more technological questions, opportunities that needs to be treated and understand uh, before uh, panicking about the resource availability. So the next question is, is it possible to achieve similar decarbonization le levels with other powertrain options? And uh, this is coming back to the earlier one car comparison between BEVs, plug-in hybrid vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles. And if we assume a linear growth of sales, and this is the BEV case that I've been uh, talking about. And here, emissions since 2019. So the, the important metric here is really the cumulative emissions because like uh, climate risk is depending on the total CO2 in atmosphere. So when we emit is important and how much total emissions we have is really key here. So for this scenario, the total emissions is uh, 33 billion gigatons. Uh, and if we change the scenario to plug-in hybrids, as you can see, the total emissions is 35 gigatons. So it is slightly higher, but in terms of the resource availability, this will use 10% of the uh, lithium relative to the BEV case. Furthermore, uh, the infrastructure requirements with will be significantly lower because you don't need uh, like charging infrastructure as much as you need for BEVs. If we think about hydrogen, if we use with SMR, uh, the total emissions will be approximately 37 gigaton. It is still higher than the uh, BEVs, but we see a reduction in overall emissions. And for hydrogen with electrolysis, from renewables, you can see we get similar to the BEV case. The point here is basically there are many different options. And again, so a combination of all of these will be the optimal solution. But we, we shouldn't just pick one and go after that. So I think it's really important to understand these trade-offs. And depending on the utilization, it's really good to uh, like promote different technology options. And of course, similarly, we can assume uh, that there will be different adoption curves for BEVs versus fuel cell electric vehicles because fuel cell electric vehicles are less mature. Uh, so we expect to see slower growth and also hydrogen infrastructure will be also massive more than the power grid, uh, like charging infrastructure. So if we use a uh, different S curves uh, for adoption, uh, for BEVs, we can have a similar uh, electric uh, total emissions and for hydrogen with renewables, it can be slightly higher, but still we see a decline. So depending on the adoption curve. 
And uh, in the next uh, four to five minutes, I want to uh, briefly talk about the power and transportation sector uh, coming together and the linkage between these two. And here, basically, the, all of these also important to understand that they change, all these analysis change based on the time of the day when we charge these vehicles. Because uh, if even if you are at a similar average carbon intensive regions like California and New York, the composition of power grid is different. So for California, as we discussed, it is more solar heavy. So midday, we have a huge uh, advantage for charging because it's pretty much very low uh, carbon intensity. And you can see in the third graph here, life cycle emissions are dipping during midday to a very low values. But if you are in New York, your base load is hydropower and nuclear. And only the extra power is basically met by uh, uh, gas generators, natural gas generators. So if you have midday or afternoon charging, actually your greenhouse gas emission intensity is higher. And overnight it is lower because you have lower loads in the system. And when we look in terms of the uh, BEV life cycle emissions, so you can see if you do midday charging in California, you cut down your emissions by 50%. So if you want to get the full advantage of your EV fleet, then you should enable midday charging. But if you are in New York, the, it's the flip side. So basically you need to promote overnight charging and minimize the midday charging and evening charging because these are the times that you are mostly using, relying on extra natural gas generation. And the, the bottom line here is that depending on where you are, coming back to the regional differences point, uh, the infrastructure requirement will be different. Uh, so for example, for California, you need to make sure that in office spaces where people are parking, you need to have EV charging stations. But in New York, uh, uh, for overnight charging, either in residential areas or in the streets, you need to have massive EV charging structures, so the infrastructure, so that you can benefit from these uh, le least uh, emission intensive times. And also, this is a moving target because like uh, today's California is very different from today's U.S. Southeast. And in U.S. Southeast, we still see um, less renewables in the system. And greenhouse gas emission intensity is quite uh, stable because we don't see that much solar or wind in the system. Uh, and you can see in the emissions, uh, per de depending on the time of the day, uh, so in California, there's a huge change and relative to hybrid electric vehicles, it is significantly lower using EVs. But in Florida, so throughout the day, you get similar uh, life cycle uh, emissions uh, and hybrids are slightly higher, but not you don't see the difference that you see in California. But over time, we expect to see a change in power system in Southeast. So we will see more solar, uh, which means we will see a similar dip in the midday charging, midday emission intensity of the power system. And by 2030, we, we hope to see a very significant uh, share coming from solar that uh, significantly reduces the midday emission intensity. So basically the moving target aspect of this is uh, for this kind of scenario, uh, the charging time will play an important role starting 2025, right? So because you will have more solar, you will then see an uh, increased benefit of having BEV, BEV midday charging. And this will go through till uh, we fully decarbonize this system. And so the point here is that this is a moving target, uh, but we, we, are unable, we are able to run many scenarios and really understand the impacts of different choices and different investments for infrastructure. And this is just an example from US Southeast. Uh, so with that, I would like to stop the presentation and take your questions. But the key takeaways are, there's a huge change in energy system and this is an unforeseen change because now we see all these sectors are coming together and 
today I, I wanted to share a story between uh, transportation and power system, but you can have very similar uh, stories for industry sector, uh, residential sector, connecting with others, so on and so forth. So with Sesame, we really want to build a platform that you can answer some of these questions and do detailed analysis uh, to understand various futures. And I am not claiming that you can find the solution, but there are many opportunities out there and we need to understand trade-offs before making decisions so that our decisions will be close to uh, being uh, optimal. So thank you for your attention and uh, I'll see if we have any questions. All right, thank you very much, <clears throat> Emre. Uh, we do have a, a couple of questions here. I'm gonna start with one, maybe looking at your, your, your last slide you had up there. Um, you kind of have this nice looking interface and you wanna make this open source, you said. Uh, how, do you, how do you anticipate people interacting with the tool is it like a downloading tool? Is it a web-based interface? Uh, you know, how long would you expect it to run, or who do you ex who would you hope would use this? Uh, researchers like me, or other people uh, besides uh, you know energy system researchers? So, so uh, it will be a web-based tool. So currently, it is like we built a, a web-based uh, user interface. So it has a nice user interface that can be used, uh, and uh, so like you, you will have a login information and you will be able to use it. Uh, and my hope is that uh, hopefully uh, not only researchers will use it because uh, you already have tools that you use and others, academic institutions, researchers already have tools that they can use. So I, my goal is really to be able to use by a broader community, decision makers, policy makers, uh, people who are not expert in the area. So actually we are building a very simple to use version which will have like a couple of clicks uh, to compare different options and perform scenario analysis. But of course, for advanced users, there are many novel features that you hopefully you will find interesting and you will add to your existing toolbox. Excellent. I, yeah, so I, I wish you good luck. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good challenge, but I'm happy you're taking it on and you look like you have a nice, really nice interface there. So that's good work. Uh, we'll go to one of the, the questions here. Uh, this is kind of a question about, you know, how you would, I guess, run things in the model, uh, uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles. So this is a question of, you know, wh what kind of behavior uh, did you assume for plug-in hybrid vehicles? You could maybe expand that to, you know, how do you anticipate allowing people to change assumptions about behavior of use of technologies like plug-in hybrid vehicles? And for those maybe not looking at the question, it's kind of relating to, you know, if you have a plug-in, how much do you actually assume someone drives on electricity versus gasoline? But So go ahead. So for, for these examples, I've used 50-50, in city use and 50% uh, uh, percent, uh, high, uh, gasoline and electricity. Yeah, uh, but but of course it changes, and uh, like you can play around these scenarios in Sesame. So, but th these graphs are using 50-50, and also I've recently uh, switched to plug-in hybrids, and I am experiencing a very similar issue that uh, is highlighted in the Q and A with uh, Matthew. So, uh, but for my in city use, I am like 100% using electric electricity, which is like surprising to me, and it has a a uh, 16 mile range and uh, like for Boston area, it is more than enough for a round trip to go to your office and go back to your home. Uh, and I am like, it's, I am able to charge overnight. So it is uh, pretty efficient, but of course, when you have longer distances or you do trips, uh, then you rely on gasoline. Uh, but of course, like regenerative braking also helps uh, with the efficiency. Uh, so like overall, it makes a huge difference using plug-in hybrid, at, I see from my personal experience. And actually I decided to switch to plug-in hybrid af after the analysis that we have done. And like my experience works so far, so I'm quite happy. Uh, but, but like short answer is for this particular graph, I use 50-50, but it, it depends on the driver uh, and use case. So you can play around. Excellent. Practice what you preach. Your analysis informed your car purchase. There you go. Um, uh, here's a good one. Oh, it's maybe perhaps difficult. Um, 
this is a question on how does the tool work or what are you working on related to demand response uh, for these electricity scenarios? Easy to put in a targeted demand given the user inputs, but demand response is a, is a little bit trickier maybe than a car. Do you have any insights into this? Or So uh, we haven't particularly modeled demand response, but what we have done is uh, we have created a connection between power system and transportation sector model that you have flexible charging. And we, what we do is based on the resource availability, we are using EV charging as flexible demand. And we, the model can shift the demand so that you can find the optimal you, uh, like meeting demand from renewables by minimizing energy uh, storage requirements. And we are currently working on a very similar interaction between industry and power system uh, so that you will have a like hydrogen production that might be flexible, uh, other industrial opportunities. They are not that flexible, but you can assume it's flexible and optimize the overall system. But other than that, we haven't done uh, other demand response scenarios. Uh, yeah, let me just follow up on that for in terms of running the tool um, and solving for this flexibility. How, how long does that take? Does it just take minutes or? hours if someone were going to use the tool so, so uh, for this particular example so uh, for power system connection we use a uh, hourly year so representation so basically you have uh, 8760 hours uh, and we have resource profiles for different regions and if you are using for one year and one region it takes minutes but if you expand and add more years and more regions and create co more complex structures, it can uh, it can last longer, uh, as as you know. So it it can even last weeks. But for the we for this particular applications, we are more interested in quick insights, and from this you will go to a more advanced uh, tool so that you really optimize the system configuration. Okay, I guess here's a question about input data to some degree. The question is specific about uh, inputting future forecasts of costs of different technologies in the tool, but we might expand the question into um, how do you envision different assumptions for costs being able to input into the tool and can someone put their own you know, cost assumption into the tool and that kind of thing to make it, I guess, harder to run, but more flexible for, for people like you and I. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so uh, basically, we have uh, we have both options. One is we have validated data sets, so we use published uh, reports that we, we trust. So, like from agencies that are mostly used, or national labs, so on and so forth. But also from tool utilization perspective, we allow users to pick their numbers. Uh, so, <laughs> but of course, then we don't guarantee that the results will make sense. Uh, but we have a set of both from lifecycle inventories as well as cost, a validated set that we believe it's reasonable for today as well as for the future. Right. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I might have one more question. I was kind of, I was curious. I thought you did a great display of the data for combustion turbine emissions and efficiencies on that slide. And I don't know but if we wait for another question here, but uh, your, your slide that showed the, the scatter plot, if you will, and you have these little blobs of red at low capacity factors, and I guess were for startups and shutdowns. I was just kind of curious myself if you knew which one, which little blob was related to shutting down the plant and which one was related to turning it on, or if that question even makes sense for that graph, because uh, it was nicely presented. Yeah, so basically the uh, shutdown is the uh, like lower one, so low emission uh, intensity the low emission, higher emission intensity, because uh, you stop burning. Uh, and startup is the one that really kills the emission intensity because you, you need to burn coal or natural gas depending on your thermal cycle, and then you don't generate any, anything. So it kind of goes to infinity at the beginning, and then slowly you start generating. So uh, in another version of this graph, actually, we split startup and shutdown as well. So it clearly shows when you have startups, uh, the emission intensity is very high. And when you have shutdowns, it goes to very low values. 
Right. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. I guess if you're shutting down, you're already warm and yeah, yeah you're, yeah, you're going to be going to be better there. So, all right. I think um, that's the questions we seem to have here at the moment. So I thought it was a very nice presentation of a tool that has a lot of capabilities. Uh, I'm looking forward to when it comes online uh, and testing it out. I know I've been challenged with making these kinds of tools in the past as well. And this one looks uh, quite adept and uh, with a lot of features. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, Emra Gentry of uh, MIT, research scientist. So thank you very much for being uh, and speaking at our UT Energy Symposium. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, thank you.